I'll do that a lot for being able to bring out my client. But also just showing support. And I don't say that as any disrespect to any other schools, but just saying that these two schools uh, for myself definitely uh, more meaningful. And I hope that you can all do the same with um, the relationships you do. And excuse me for taking constant tips on getting over a cold. <laughs> and so the theme of this conference is titled kind of, um, Nurturing Our Momentum. And I think before we, we continue off and say what is this momentum we're going to, I think we need to look at what is what is it that we came from. And so if you can imagine, okay, this is Washington State, I hope you all know this is Washington State. <laughs> If you don't, you're not going to survive. If you don't, you're not going to survive. If you would imagine, though, visually, uh, where all the schools are located on this map. I don't know that you know where the schools are located on this map. Um, so if you can imagine, the time is the mid-90s. Nobody has, uh, I don't think, I don't know if that's going to be here. There's a dial-up. You don't know what dial-up is. I mean, you're involved in the phone. You're connected. You're connected. <laughs> I got the DSL, I was lucky. But what I'm trying to say is, what we have now, like many of you may be tweeting, or on Facebook, or whatever, or on speaking, which is great. But at this time, they didn't have that. In order to talk to one another, you need to pick up the phone and call someone that you've never met, which is probably really weird to say, like, hey, I got your number from so and so, which is probably weird still. You know what? Or avoid face-to-face, uh, okay, in person. I'm assuming maybe some people won't matter. I don't know. I think that takes like a week. But uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is uh, the creation of the alliance started out of isolation. I think Pullman, uh, Central Washington, the folks who came from Oregon, uh, you know how long these drives are. It's hard, especially if you want to do the past. I think many of us want to do the past even when it's not. See if you have a letter with the request. Uh, but so, the point of view is again, so that isolation was hard. It was hard to communicate, it was hard to talk to one another. But I think once the alliance was formed, initially it was the Washington State Alliance. But as we're able to reach out and grasp to, to Oregon State, that was when it was known to become the Northwest Latino American Student Alliance. Woo! Yeah. 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 So, what I want to say is, what this is a representation of, for those of you who are this is very new to this conference, this is 18 years in the making. So look back and say that our communities came together from all of these different local communities, some of them being a more larger cause uh, of what was going on. And they were able to create something that wasn't just a statewide conference, or a statewide alliance. It was something that was real, something that crossed the conference, that went across the borders of Washington State to make it comprehensive. And so I want to also <clears throat> tell you all that because of this, we have an opportunity to do something great. What is that? So, all of us being here today, I'm going to do this, maybe 300 of us, have an opportunity to do something great. And how do I know this? It's not just my opinion, it's fact. <clears throat> if we look at history, and some of you political science majors may know what I'm talking about, um, looking back at history, this is something that was very much or taking notes from someone else um, in Oregon, but it's, a, it's a blueprint, and it's not just a blueprint, it's ours, it's a blueprint to look back, not to see what was done before us, but how do we continue what was done before us? Because I think we all know what this room, how challenging things can be right some examples of this is this short picture. <clears throat> if you can't read it, it says power to the people, black power to black people, yellow power to yellow people. This is during the civil rights movement in the 60s. And so this is a time when it wasn't just African American folks in the community fighting for, for their rights. It was all communities of color coming together to address the needs of what people needed. And those things were um, being recognized as all of our rights uh, protected. And so having gender, race, class, all of these different things. Who are as individuals being protected uh, because 
<clears throat> As you know, it was. It was still being very segregated. As we move on to this next slide, another very major critical point in all of our history of people here was the Vietnam War protest also in the mid-60s. Uh, this was a time when there was a lot of public outcry against the war. And I think because of the public outcry, especially with the Vietnam War involvement, we were able to shift public opinion. I think uh, Muhammad Ali was also one of the most uh, recognized people during the time to say that he did not want to go to be around the fight. This top, this top image in the top right, um, where it says solidarity, uh, they were, they were a little old, I know he had a mustache, I think it was cool at the time. Uh, <laughs> they were actually college students, though. So, during the late 60s and early 70s, there was something uh, called the Third World Liberation Front that was going on in uh, the Bay Area. And this was when the Black Student Union, the Latino American Student Organization, Asian American Political Alliance, Filipino American Collegiate and Beaver, and Native American Students Union at San Francisco State University came together to bring up the fact that we needed ethnic studies in school. And so, for any of you who do have ethnic studies right now, our major in those, I think it is a, it's a great privilege to be able to have those because there was a long struggle to get those classes. Um, in fact, it was one of the longest student fronts in the nation's history um, at the Cisco State University. <coughs> Another major thing was um, from 40, 1948 to uh, 1973 was the draft. All of us have the opportunity to choose whether or not we want to go into the military. But back then, when you were a draft, you kind of have to go. And so what you can see here is the students at the bottom left corner, they're their draft papers to say, no, I'm not going to go to war. I'm not going to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know, a lot of it was the premises of the, the public attention that the media portrayed the war at. Um, there was a lot of violent things going on at the time. Uh, people felt like being in Vietnam wasn't something they needed to be doing. And it's very similar to what happened in the Middle East, right? <laughs> I think the second row. So, this is not about how much you have to do it or what you have to do. I don't know what I mean, but it's Saturday. The reason I have to tell you is because uh, one major environment I think all of us have to have is if you voted for Barack Obama or who are you voting for, whether it's the president. Or not. Um, up in, in 1965, we had these women to vote. Um, but at the same time, um, people began to use the slogan that was old enough to fight, old enough to vote. And so eventually in 1971, the 26th Amendment was officially adopted, allowing the voting age to be 18. Which I think is a great thing, because oftentimes um, there's some sort of stigma that you need to be 21 and over to be considered an adult or responsible. I actually think 18 um, is good. You know, some questionable to be the other, but for me, you can go This bottom one, the bottom right corner image, is in the middle of you. And it was something known as the first quarter store. And if you're not familiar, this happened during the 1970s, from January to March, the first quarter of the year. Um, and it was when a union student in the Philippines um, were protesting against government corruption. And so there was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of questionable things going on with uh, electoral votes. Uh, Ferdinand Marcos was the president at this time. And so in short, <clears throat> uh, during this time, it was a very political moment. And it was, the, I know the, the five other images are specific things, but I think the sixth one I wanted to add was to say that specifically for Filipinos in this room, we have a very long history of Latin America. A very long history of resistance, such as the First Quarter Storm, where an honest Bonifacio of Casitura led the Philippine Revolution against anti colonial Spain um, way back in the day. And I think using an honest Bonifacio of as an example, it took over 300 years to kick the Spanish out of the Philippines. If you know how big the Philippines is, as a large island, as an archipelago, as not having internet, no, having no longer the time, 
I think uh, the collective effort that the people coming together to struggle for something larger than themselves, although it is long, it's, and it's a time, we eventually got it because we're coming together. <coughs> So, all of us in this room today, as you can see, we have the social responsibility of an inheriting this world. <clears throat> so what exactly are we inheriting? So this graphic, the graphic uh, represents 2008 to 2013, the top uh, five highest tuition increases. So, I'll break down the numbers for you really quick. Um, so Arizona is the highest, Georgia is the lowest in the top five. <clears throat> the Washington State being the red, <coughs> being the red um, high cotton is at 63.6%. So in short, what I'm saying is in the past five years, tuition has increased twice for you. Twice the amount. So whatever you're paying right now, it was Twice less than it is. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> 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 Again, so this black line going up is like two years above the debt, and this white uh, red screen is like that. And if you didn't know, so in 2011, student debt surpassed credit card debt. In 2012, student debt surpassed one trillion dollars. In the past decade, it's tripled. I think an interesting part about student debt that often isn't talked about is the very fact that if you default on your payments, meaning you don't pay for whatever reason too much, um, you're behind on your payments, you're avoiding the one phone calls, they are able to garnish your your uh, paycheck. Meaning they can take money directly out of your paycheck without you even authorizing it. More so, depending on what type of loan it is, they're able to even garnish your parents' well. <clears throat> garnish your parents' money. So in effect, it's somewhat of a chain of law for all of us. As we're trying to get through college and uh, attain our degree, we have this uh, kind of lingering over us. And to put into context how much $1 trillion is, we would have to spend $100 every second for the next what, 317 years. You'd have to give whatever person on the planet $142, or you could buy a Facebook for the company 20 times. I don't know the current value. But for you being a debt, not a lot of money, right? So where am I going with this? Why are these people being up here? Well, <laughs> currently, uh, for the 2012 statistics, uh, 2013 obviously, we're only in April, so it's hard to really say. But uh, one in two graduates are jobless or unemployed. Unemployed meaning that the job that you have now is not enough to pay for what you need. So minimum wage in the Washington, you may be making, you may be making nineteen or nine dollars and nineteen cents with a college degree. And so, in effect, it's almost a double-sided um, blade, right? Tuition is increasing. There's no jobs for us out there, and so then what happens? In effect, if we're not able to find jobs, and I back up to my previous slide about student debt, what are most of us going to do? Stay in college, right? What makes more sense? Graduate in school um, and looking for a job, and because for many of us, we're not set up yet to find a job because we don't work as hard, or face the reality of, of being a new employee. <clears throat> So, 52.6% of bachelor's degree holders under 25 are jobless or unemployed. And this is the highest it's been in 11 years, or in the past decade. And it's a cycle we need to break. But how do we break it? I'll show you the other You can go on and write a book after this. 
So, I think we all know we're affected by these issues. Um, I think we're specifically talking about this topic, if you look at what the workshops are, 9 out of 16 workshops are related to networking and young, um, young professionals in post-college life. And I don't say that as it is, but I think that you acknowledge what is the current condition all of us are facing. I think networking cannot be the only way to solve these problems that I just talked about. I think as a start for a short-term solution for all of us in this room, or maybe our friends, why don't we address the root problems? I think if we're not able to address these root problems, we're going to continue to face the same thing. And so, looking at this image, uh, what if I told you that I'm looking for one of the important characters is not enough? I think shared information and, and building with each other and establishing relationships is great, and it's a start. But for all if any of us just leave it at that, it's not enough. Um, we can pull the roots out, but we're going to have to expect to pull the weeds again next season. It's going to continue to happen, whether it's our generation or the next generation. So there is hope. I do not have these slides up just to make you sad. Um, I commend all of you also for being here this morning. I definitely think the energy is high. I mean, to see the chat, to see the schools represented, to have the Oregon school present, to have the Austin and full number, to have high school students here. It was great. And I think it's just a high part of what we'll be able to accomplish. But would it, be, it would not be correct if I did not present here and say that this is a call to action, though. And so if there's anything that you get out of my keynote and what I'm talking about, is that this is a call to action. And that we all need to be proactive and partake in shaping all of our futures. Not just our being this, this, in this room, our friends, our family, but all of us. For the next 18 years of conference attendees, what will it look like for them? I think for all of us also, we're the first, uh, part of the first generation to have access to instant information, as I said. Um, some of you again probably are your folks. But I think that information that we're sharing, <laughs> I think all of the information though, that we can share is good, but at the same time, it's only supplemental to the work that we're actually doing. Actually doing is what I mean. What I mean by saying actually doing is what we're doing um, in addition to the information we're trying to share. What good is it sharing facts and numbers if we don't have any sort of way to look at it and say this is why it's wrong? I love you and you're being disagree with me, and that's why. Well, that's what we need is being able to have some sort of perspective on these problems. <clears throat> All of us here today are leaders, I think. Regardless if you're an officer, or if you're new, or whatever it is. For the very fact that you're here, you are a leader. And I think we should all recognize that. And don't be fooled by the idea that you need to work your way up the ladder. No. I think um, the best way to, to look at how to be a leader is to try. And have a good reason for why you're trying. I also think it's good to acknowledge and know the difference between what are good leaders and great right leaders. <clears throat> good leaders are able to speak up um, on issues and, and be kind of a face. But I think what we need right now for our generation and for all of us in this world are greater leaders who cultivate leadership. Leadership that's beyond when whoever is doing something now is able to guard those positions. It's a take lead, and not to feel like those who come after are going to fulfill those shoes. So, <laughs> this is me bringing tattoos and prayer. Um, what I wanted to get on is for myself with part of my journey to, to wanting to solve these problems, but getting involved with unemployment. <laughs> And I have this picture up here with Christopher Beltran, who is in the Philippines, uh, an organizer, a labor organizer, and he's been organizing all of his life uh, for the poor and the press, standing up for those who, who do not have voices in, in uh, the political realm. And he had a saying that he would often say in most of those work, was, I'd rather die on my feet with honor than to live on the bending and shame. <clears throat> and so I, I share that to say, Whatever it is you do believe in, don't ever feel like you can't take a stand. And if it, you're the only one who's doing it, it's better than to be quiet. Because I think uh, 
the first one is also the head of that. The first one is political. All of you being here today and at this conference is a political decision. Whether or not you want to come from the night life, the friends brought you out, the ones who are here to talk to the face off, what's coming up to tell you, it is a political decision to want to be here and learn. And in addition to just learning, to also build relationships. So, we're trying to go next to the 18 years of God. As long as there are problems, we'll continue to have you take taking questions such as, what are we going to turn our momentum and who is it for? I don't have, I personally do not have the answer to that question. But I think we're all able to build a strong cohesion with each other and grow us alive, as it says, 18 years of God. I think we'll get closer to finding that answer. And so, <clears throat> we like to offer you this public advice. Uh, without a constitutional, as a, as a late Filipino professor, he often wrote about, a lot about the school grades, professor says. And the point is, the youth of today are not only the product of the system, they're, they're also the antithesis of that system. Or, I think if we were to look at it, as Tupac before said, I was given this world and I didn't make it. And so we were all born into to this world with these problems. And it sucks, right? I would imagine it sucks. Um, but I think the positive thing to look at is, and it's always hopeful, is that because we're born to these problems, we all have direct experience because related to those problems to solve them. Whether it's all of us knowing how much we have to pay the student debt alone, or looking for a job. If we were all able to come together and talk about these issues, we would be able to solve what that question is of what we're moving forward to. So, Right after this, when you all go to your workshops, meet new people, participate and be active in your learning, I want you all to think about how you can apply what you're learning today. And there are certain past these 18 years. I think all of us being a part of classes and coming to the conference should not just be limited to our college experience. Us wanting to learn, us wanting to question things, us wanting to test up what we do is right. Building relationships with people beyond what we're comfortable with. These are all things that don't need to end with resentment college. And so, as we're going through these things, through the workshops in the day, and talking to people, whatever, whatever, I like to close out with these words. Um, so, if not now, then who? And if not us, then who? Right? Because I think we all know these things are going to continue to get worse. And I'm sure if we ask our parents about what they were going through, it was probably not as bad as it is now. And they'll probably tell you to just keep trying and working hard, but I think having to work hard, we should do it together. So, thank you for letting me speak in front of you all, and I hope you guys have a great day.